Okay, people, let's look at William Cooper's 1784 poem, The Poplar Field. Now, here's a miserable poem that Cambridge has set for the IGCSE exam, of the sort that won't cheer you up if you're already sad and bored during lockdown. Thanks, Cambridge. Now, this is why I study it at Oxford instead. So you can see the poem here on screen. My advice is that you pause this video now and slowly read through this poem before we move on. OK, go on then, read it. I expect that really lifted your mood, didn't it? Right, what I want to do in this video are these three things. One, learn some very basic facts about Cooper's life and only those that might help you with understanding this poem. Two, I'll read the poem as I think it could be sensibly read. And three, we'll perform a close reading of the poplar field line by line taking notes. First things first though, let's get used to calling him Cooper, not Cowper. It's one of those oddities of the English language. If you call him Cowper, I'll phone Cambridge and tell them to fail you. Good. Now, who was William Cooper? Well, he was a mid to late 18th century English poet who published this poem, The Poplar Field, in 1784. Cooper wrote this poem about a location in East Anglia in the east of England, which is where I grew up and where he lived for most of his adult life. It's also that part of England where the University of Cambridge is located, if facts about our exam board excite you. Well, poor old Cooper suffered from what we'd almost certainly these days call depression. He tried to kill himself four times and believed that God had told him to do this in dreams. He was regularly struck down with the unpleasant belief that God had planned his eternal damnation in hell and that things were going to be generally unpleasant for him in the afterlife, which he strongly believed in, as he was quite a strict Christian. Perhaps that depression feeds into this poem, which, as we shall see, contains some rather dark reflections on mortality and the only very brief pleasures of life. If Cooper had lived today, he would probably have received some professional psychiatric help. As it was, he lived over 200 years ago, so he was locked up in a mental asylum for quite some time. If we are going to more generously remember Cooper, we should probably turn to his poetry rather than the sad state of his mental health. On the level of, of his uh, poetic writing, Cooper was quite an impressive type. For example, A, he was a rare example of a poet who was very popular and respected in his own lifetime. B, he was primarily admired as a nature poet and his writing influenced a whole later generation of nature poets. I don't know, for example, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, William Wordsworth. And of course, this poem, The Poplar Field, is a nature poem. C. He was an abolitionist. That is, he was somebody who believed, quite rightly, that slavery should be abolished. And his slightly longer poem, The Negro's Complaint, criticised England's continuing support for the slave trade. And the brilliant 20th century American civil rights campaign adopted Martin Luther King was a fan and would frequently quote Cooper's poem, The Negro's Complaint. So Cooper might have been a bit crazy in the eyes of his contemporaries, but he was also a good man for his time in many ways. OK, so let's read Cooper's The Poplar Field, the poem Cambridge has set us for IGCSE study. Notice how I read it in a slightly melancholy or reflectively sad voice of the sort I think fits the poem's topic of lost pleasure. Don't worry if you don't feel you've not understood everything about the poem yet, because that's what we'll do next. A close reading of the whole piece. So let's read it. The Poplar Field by William Cooper. The poplars are felled. Farewell to the shade and the whispering sound of the cool colonnade. The winds play no longer and sing in the leaves, nor ooze on his bosom their image receives. 
Twelve years have elapsed since I last took a view of my favourite field and the bank where they grew. And now in the grass, behold, they are laid, and the tree is my seat that once lent me a shade. The blackbird has fled to another retreat, where the hazels afford him a screen from the heat, and the scene where his melody charmed me before resounds with his sweet flowing ditty no more. My fugitive years are all hasting away, and I must ere long lie as lowly as they, with a turf on my breast and a stone at my head, ere another such grove shall arise in its stead. Tis a sight to engage me, if anything can, to muse on the perishing pleasures of man. Though his life be a dream, his enjoyments, I see, have a being less durable even than he. Okay, that's probably cheered you up a lot. Okay, so this poem's title, uh, The Poplar Field, simply mentions what the poem will be about, a field of cut-down poplar trees, which Cooper last visited some 12 years ago. Now, the poplar is a native British tree that was quite frequently planted in that past part of East Anglia where Cooper lived because it coped well with a very wet landscape. It's a flood landscape. In Cooper's day, they were frequently cut down to make cheap timber for houses. Today, even now, the once common poplar is becoming very rare again and even endangered as a tree species in Britain. So perhaps Cooper's poem has some modern day relevance then. Sadly, this news would probably have made him even more depressed, I guess. Anyway, let's start with stanza one. And I'm calling these stanzas because they are regular verses, a bit like the stanzas we find in hymns. And indeed, Cooper did write hymns. He wrote hymns with, for example, Newton, a man called Newton, who wrote uh, Amazing Grace. So Cooper was a hymn writer. Now, these stanzas are all four lines long, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and so on. And you could call them quatrains if you wanted to sound clever. A four-line stanza can be called a, a quatrain. And uh, the, the lines have a regular rhythm as well. Um, it's got a name, but I won't tell you it. The poplars are felled, farewell to the shade, and the whispering sound of the cool colonnade. The winds play no longer and sing in the leaves. Um, and the rhyme scheme, if you want to say, is shade, colonnade, leaves, receive. So the rhyme scheme is A-A-B-B, -B. view, grew, laid, shade, A-A-B-B, -B. retreat, heat, before, more, A-A-B-B, -B. And, and so on. Although you don't have to mention this fact in any exam essay unless you can make it relevant to an essay question. So don't, just for the sake of it, say, oh, these, these are quatrains rhyming A-A-B-B, -B, unless you can make that point really relevant to your, to your essay. Now, let's look at line one. In line one, we hear that the trees have been felled or cut down, and Cooper immediately starts talking aloud as if lamenting their disappearance. To lament means to wail about or cry about or be sad about their disappearance. Now, the first thing he misses is the uh, shade. The first thing he misses, I think, is the shade that they used to provide. Then in line two, he misses the sound of the breeze playing through the leaves, which provided a cool place to sit. He says that when they were alive, they formed a colonnade, which means a long planted row of man-made planted trees, man-planted trees. Now that word whisper is worth looking at, the whispering sound of the cool colonnade. And it's worth quoting because it suggests a delicate or a gentle sound, that is a pleasant sound. Indeed, in this poem, everything that the trees used to provide 12 or more years, years ago was pleasant according to Cooper's memory of them. So all these three uh, first stanzas contain sort of pleasant memories of what the trees gave him. And all of the senses are there, uh, sight, 
sound, touch with the coolness of the shade, all of the senses, the pleasant effect that the trees had on, this, on his senses are there in the first three stanzas. Now in line three, we hear that, um, in, in line three here, we learn that the, um, the winds no longer play and they no longer sing in the trees. So the winds play no longer and they no longer sing. But this word play and sing are again really, really lovely words, aren't they? I mean, he's remembering the pleasure that the trees used to give them. They used to play, they used to sing. And then finally in stanza one, the fourth line, this last line, suggests that the river ooze, this ooze of the river ooze, no longer acts as a mirror to receive an image or reflection of the trees on its bosom or breast. So what he's remembering there is how um, the trees used to reflect on the surface of the river ooze when he was there 12 or so years ago. But now it's not there. You just get the brown river uh, flowing by without that beautiful reflection of the trees. So he's missing the sights. He's missing the sounds. He's missing the feeling of the coolness on his skin. Um, so this first stanza is all about things that have been lost since the trees were felled. And in fact, the whole poem is very much about loss. It's a poem about loss of different things. Now, the second stanza explains to the reader really what's going on. Cooper reveals that he, he used to know this field very well, and he knows it very well. And it's been a full 12 years since he was here to enjoy the then living poplars. And I think we need, really need to be able to express in any essay the massive contrast in this poem between then and now between the living and the dead. This poem is all about contrast, the pleasant past, the horrible present, and the horrible future. The pleasant past, and the horrible present, and the horrible future. The trees, when they were alive, created a beautiful habitat. Now, when they're dead, it's like a wasteland of death, decay, and misery for Cooper. It makes him very sad. Now, in the second line of this second stanza, we learn that it's not just any old field, it's Cooper's favourite field. It's his favourite field, the one he enjoyed sitting in most to experience the joys of nature. There on the bank of the River Ouse, the poplars grew beautifully and gave him pleasure. But not any more, as they now lay in the grass. They lay in the grass. In the grass, behold, they are laid. They are now laid in the Grass. Now, Cooper now addresses the reader directly in this poem. And look at his use of this word, behold. That's a really interesting word, behold. He says, and now in the grass, behold, they are laid. Now, this, is, this behold is a very dramatic way and slightly old-fashioned way, even in his day, of saying, look. It's a command, behold, look. But it's an old-fashioned one, yes, even in Cooper's day. It means more than just look. It means perhaps, for goodness sake, look at what's going on here. Just look at what's happened to these trees. So Cooper is not a happy chappy. Also, that image of them laid in the grass is perhaps the first funereal image in this poem. Funereal image in this poem. This is sort of the first image of death and funerals because we also lay the human dead to rest under the grass. And this will become important later in the poem. Finally, that last line of the second stanza shows another stark contrast between the once living trees and the now dead ones. Once they gave him shade from above. Now, from below, they merely act as a seat which he sits on, exposed to the elements. And the tree is my seat that once lent me a shade. So once they gave him shade when they were alive, beautiful shade, but now he merely acts as a seat on which he sits. Now he's either sitting on the tree stump or he's sitting on the horizontal trunk of the tree or as uh, Cambridge suggests at the bottom of the page in its notes, uh, um, it was, uh, the tree was made into a chair that he's sitting in. I don't think that's necessarily true actually, but whatever, 
he's now sitting sadly, almost dejectedly, in the field. We can imagine him almost sitting with his head in his hands, as a bereaved person might sit at the foot of a grave. OK, let's look at this third stanza now. Let's look at the third stanza. Then we'll pause before looking at the last two stanzas. Now, in this third stanza, we return to what was happening in stanza one, to the things that have been lost now that the trees have been felled. As Cooper reflects on what the colonnade of trees used to provide some 12 years ago. So um, stanza three is also about what things used to be like 12 years ago and what's been lost. Now the first thing that Cooper misses in this third stanza is the blackbird. The blackbird. Which has fled to another retreat, flying away to a safer place in another field where hazels grow. And hazels are another tree or large bush where the blackbird here that can now be safe from the heat of the day in the way it used to be safe in the poplar field before they were cut down. Now, we, I think at this point we have to assume that Cooper's poem is set in the summer in England because that is the only time in England when there's, where there's, uh, when there's any real heat and when shade is required. Now, I think it's worth pointing out that the blackbird here isn't just any old bird in uh, English poetry or in the English psyche, in the English mind. It's one of England's few beautiful songbirds. Uh, Britain doesn't have many beautiful songbirds, but the blackbird is one of them. And you might, uh, after this uh, video, or even now if you pause it, want to search on YouTube for what a blackbird song sounds like. It is a very beautiful song, especially for a British songbird. And this is what Cooper reveals he misses about the blackbird's disappearance. It's song. He misses its song. He misses its melody, we hear. Because that melody used to charm Cooper or please him and make him happy. It used to cheer him up. Quite rare for Cooper, I guess. But in the past, when everything was there, the poplars were there, the song of the blackbird would, would cheer him up. But now, in the present, in the future, things are very, very different. It used to make him happy. And yet, as we learn in that last line of the third stanza, the scene no longer resounds, or echoes, resounds means sort of pleasantly echoes, with his sweet flowing ditty no more. His sweet flowing ditty. And ditty, well, Sweet, sweet flowing suggests something beautiful, but also the word ditty means a beautiful, simple song. The simple beauty of the blackbird song has gone. So everything about the blackbird song was beautiful, but now it has gone because the poplars have gone. The destruction of one thing, the trees, leads to further cascading sadness, sadness upon sadness, as everything else disappears, the shade, the blackbird, the beautiful view of the trees reflected on the surface of the River Ouse. Everything disappears when the trees have gone. Um, so Cooper's poem perhaps shows an early understanding that if you destroy a collection of trees, you destroy an entire habitat or ecosystem for a number of creatures. He realises when the trees have gone, everything around it that was beautiful disappears. OK, so that's the first three stanzas. But what I want us to do here is pause and reflect on these first three stanzas, which I believe form a unit in themselves. I think these first three stanzas here, one, two and three, I think they set the scene once. There was a beautiful field of poplars, which brought with it many pleasures, but now there's nothing but emptiness. And students, here I want you to pause and think. Remember, the exam board rightly wants you to have your own views about these poems and about what's being said in them. And you must do this in an essay. You must put your own views using I, I, occasionally. And I want you to think about how you could read Cooper's attitude in these first stanzas in either of two ways. So I think we could read Cooper's attitude in these first three stanzas in either of two ways. 
either one, we accept and share Cooper's view that there is nothing but tragedy here in this scene, in this field of fallen poplars, that everything's very sad. Or two, we could also be a little critical of Cooper and think him a bit self-indulgent or self-pitying or even selfish. You could say that he's, he's less worried about what has happened to nature, to these trees, and is more concerned, selfishly, about what has happened to his own pleasures. Perhaps he seems a little bit too much to think that the trees were there for his benefit in the first place. Now, you could believe either or both of these things, that Cooper's worried about nature and the dead poplars, and or, and or, that he's selfishly worried about only his own concerns. But if you want an A star, if you want the top, top marks at IGCSE, you will probably be able to say that the poem to this point, that the poem up until this point, the end of stanza three, could be read in different ways by different people. So I want you to think about it. What do you think about Cooper's attitude at this point? Is he genuinely sad about what's happened to nature? Or is he more selfishly worried about his own um, emotions, his own feelings? Right. Now I want you to do something before we read the fourth and the fifth stanzas. I want you to do what I've done here already. I want you to draw a line here, a line here, between the third and the fourth stanzas. Okay, go on, do it. Draw that line. Good. Now, I wanted you to draw this line because I think that at this point in the poplar field, Cooper makes what is a traditional turn where something different begins to happen. So let's then call this line the turning point in this poem. I think this line is the turning point in this poem. Now, if you wanted to be clever, you could call it the Volta. Instead of calling it the turn, you could call it the Volta, which is an Italian word that also means turn. It's a word that we often use when discussing turns in poems or changes in poems, the Volta, or the turning point, whichever word you like. Now, I've said that having a turning point at some point in a poem is traditional or perhaps common in Western poetry. So what do I mean? Well, in a lot of Western poetry, especially in sonnets, but the popular field here is not a sonnet, poems are divided into two major sections. A slightly longer section for Cooper, it's these first three stanzas, a slightly longer section in which a poet presents a scene as Cooper does here, yes, in stanzas one to three. Secondly, following a turn, this point in the poem, there's a second and often, sh often shorter final section into the poem in which the poet reflects or meditates upon the scene he or she presented at the start of the poem. And I think that's what happens here. Scene, reflection. Scene is set, reflection. The scene is set of the poplar field, and here is Cooper's reflection at the end. Now this certainly happens in this poem, as we'll see in a minute, but it happens with other poems in our Birds, Beasts and the Weather section of the Cambridge Poetry Anthology. For example, if you've read, I don't know, Edna St. Vincent Millay's modern sonnet, The Buck in the Snow, you'll know that St. Vincent Millay presents a scene in the first part of her poem of a lively male deer that's later discovered dead. So that's the scene in St. Vincent Millay's poem of a lively male deer that is later discovered dead. That's the scene. But then there's a turn or a volta partway through her poem. And then in the second half of her poem, she reflects or muses, she thinks about the strangeness of life and death in this world. She um, gets a message out of the scene that she created at the beginning of her poem. And many poems do this. Anyway, let's move then, <coughs> excuse me, onto the second 
a more reflective part of the poplar field, in which Cooper, if you like, strokes his chin and thinks about what all of this in the first three stanzas means. Um, this poplar field that used to be wonderful, but is now just a sorry sight. He reflects upon it. And because this is Cooper, um, his message or his moral lesson will be very miserable. So take a deep breath, cheer yourself up, tickle yourself or something before we move on to stanza four. Okay, stanza four. With this word my right at the beginning here, with this word my, Cooper jumps straight into his own personal reflections and what the felled poplars might mean for himself and possibly later all people. Now notice how often he uses the word my and I in these last stanzas. Let's try and see them. I, blah, 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 blum, jub -a -dub -a -dub, my head, jim, jum, 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 me, blah, 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 I see. So my and I appears quite a lot in the rest of this poem. So the poem is now all about me, if you like, all about Cooper, me, me, me. Now in the first line, Cooper says, that his fugitive years are all hasting away. Now, two words in this line suggest the speed at which goes by, at which uh, life goes by, and the brevity, the briefness, if you like, of life. Fugitive, the word fugitive here, means quick to disappear or fleeting. Fugitive means quick to disappear or fleeting. And then the second word, which points to the uh, the way in which life passes by quite quickly, is hasting, hasting. My fugitive years are all hasting away. And hasting, of course, means moving very quickly, going quickly. So Cooper is thinking about how little time he has left on this earth, which leads to that second line, I must ere long, or before long, I must ere long lie as lowly, as they. Sorry, it's here, not that air, here. I must ere li long lie as lowly as they. It's a bit of a tongue twister. He's saying, before very long, I will have to lie as lowly as them. Now, to, to, to lay someone low means to bring them, if you like, from, from, from health to sickness or to death, or to lay them down or to lay them low in the grave. And so Cooper here is now definitely thinking about death, about his own death, about his own mortality. He says that he will himself have a turf on his breast or grass over his body like these trees have when he is lying low in his grave with a turf on my breast and a stone at my head. So with a turf on my breast, I will soon, like these trees with grass grown over them, have grass grown over my dead body in the grave. It's a lovely image, isn't it? What a cheerful man. He will also have a stone at his head. I will have a stone at my head. And that's a gravestone, or as the Americans might say, a tombstone. And he says that this will happen, that, and that he will be dead ere another such grove arise in its stead. Now, I'll paraphrase that. I'll put it in modern English. It means this will happen to me. I will be dead before another collection of poplar trees grows to replace this field of felled trees. So before these poplars all grow again and there's a nice grove again of living poplar trees, I will be dead. So the tone at this point in the poem is, is clearly very sad. It's a very sad tone. It's even morbid as Cooper reflects upon his coming death which he suggests will be quite soon in the scheme of things. We might just reflect at this point that Cooper was about 53 years old when this poem was written. He wasn't terribly old, although I guess life expectancy in his day was uh, a, a lot shorter. And he would die 16 years after writing this, this poem. Um, but even at this time, when he was writing this poem, he was preoccupied with thoughts of death and of eternal damnation. It's worth thinking about that. He was constantly thinking about death and about his life of damnation in, in hell. A cheerful man. So um, finally moving on to stanza five in which he admits that the scene of these dead poplars 
is a sight to engage me. Tis, or it is, a sight to engage me. He means the scene of poplar, tre poplar trees is a sight to engage me, which means a sight to make me stop and think. And what does he reflect upon now? Well, he's already reflected upon his coming death, but now things get even sadder, even more depressing, because he's not just saying now that he'll die, which he's already decided, but that he's now musing or thinking about the perishing pleasures of man. Here, he means that not only do we die, but that even before we die, the things that we take pleasure in die or disappear. Now, perhaps this is another hint at his depression, because a classical symptom of depression is, of course, the inability to take pleasure in things that you used to take pleasure in, or that most people take pleasure in. So Cooper says that even human pleasure is fleeting, the perishing pleasures of man. Even human pleasure is fleeting, and such pleasures disappear, even within a person's lifetime, before he or she dies. But let's also see, let's also see another very important shift that's going on here in this poem. And I think it happens a little bit between stanza four and, <clears throat> excuse me, stanza five. You know, a couple of lines ago in stanza four, Cooper was talking only about himself and his own death. I must dare long lie as lowly as they. He was talking about himself and his own death. But now he shifted to all mankind or all man, by which, of course, he means all humankind or all people. It is a sight to engage me, if anything can, to muse on the perishing pleasures of man. And when he says man there, he means mankind or what we would now uh, call <clears throat> humankind. So he's now going beyond just himself to say that for all of us, Life will bring disappointments and the death of pleasures before we die. So he's using himself as what we might call an everyman figure. He takes his own misery that he's worked out in stanza four here, and he projects it now onto all people. He's saying, I know I'm going to, in stanza four he says, I know I'm going to die. And in stanza five he says, everybody's going to die and everybody's pleasures are going to die before them. So he takes his own experience as an every man, <clears throat> projects it onto every person. So again, at this point, you might decide in any essay that this is, again, a little self-centred and that he shouldn't perhaps project his own pessimism onto everyone else. And pessimism is an important word for this poem because it is pessimistic. He doesn't look on the bright side at all. He only looks on the negative side of things. Everything is going to be bad and then you die and everything you love dies before you. So maybe he shouldn't project his pessimism onto everybody else. Or you could be sympathetic from a modern day perspective and say that we need to understand where Cooper was coming from and that depression, which he suffered from as a disease, causes people like Cooper to always turn inward and experience nothing but their own misery. In which case, I think, uh, if we're being generous from a modern day perspective, we can forgive him for writing such a pessimistic poem based upon his depression. <clears throat> because it is a very pessimistic message that he gives us all. In effect, he's saying, not only will we all die, but also everything we love will leave us before we die. And that's very sad. And so to these last two lines of the poem. Cooper uses the old image of life being a dream. Life is a dream. Now this is a metaphor or a direct comparison with words. He says life is a dream. But then he says that our enjoyments, our pleasures, like the pleasure that he took in this poplar field when it was alive, have a being less durable even than he. So these pleasures have a being less durable even than he, than man, than mankind, than people. So this is when he outright says it, I think. And again, I, I, I paraphrase. I'll paraphrase this last line here. 
He's saying life is fleeting and ends soon, but our enjoyments and pleasures end even sooner than our lives. Finally, before we wind up, let's go back to these two words, I see, I see. What Cooper means here is that he realises now, having reflected on the, the scene for a bit, he realises now, I see, I realise now that this is how life is for all of us. And those words I see have a sort of biblical sense of revelation or epiphany about them. I have had my eyes open and now I see. But this is no joyful revelation of love and pleasure that Cooper has. Because this is Cooper, it's the opposite. His revelation is a dark, um, miserable one. It's that life is short and then you die. But everything good dies before us. Again, this is a, a heavily depressing, pessimistic lesson from a man whose own preoccupation during his life was with death and damnation, with hell and with death. Uh, well, students, I, I, I wish I could end on a happier note there, but there we are. That's, uh, that's Cooper for you. All I can suggest is that you read this and put it aside as the work of a man who was, I hope, uh, sadder than you. Stop crying, maybe go and have some ice cream or chocolate, or cheer yourself up with a bit of SpongeBob SquarePants. Life is better than Cooper thought, and we've all got PlayStations, haven't we? So life's good. Me? Well, I'm just going to draw, I don't know, endless smiley faces. There we are, around this poem. Cheer myself up a bit. Come on, Cooper. Um, but although we might not thank Cooper for his uh, pessimistic message in this poem, because it is miserable, it's bound to get you down, we can at least thank him for writing a poem, The Poplar Field, that we can say lots and lots and lots about in an exam essay. And so, in a way, thanks, William. You were a good man, afflicted by mental illness. And we understand and we respect that. Thank you, pupils. Good luck in your exams.